Good evening and welcome to our October 22nd, 2019 um, public hearings um, for this evening. And we will start with uh, sitting as the Countywide Planning Authority, agenda item 40. Agenda item 40 is proposed ordinance amending the Pinellas County Ordinance number 15-30 as amended to update the countywide plan strategies and countywide rules. This is a second public hearing. The public hearing was properly advertised. The affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Okay, thank you. I have no cards of anyone who is signed up to speak on this agenda item. Is there anyone who wishes to um, make a comment? Okay, then I'll close the public hearing. Move we'll approval. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Long and second by Commissioner Gerard. I know, I'm trying to get into my... You said yes. Okay, okay yes, I'm Unanimous a Unanimous yes. approval, and I do want to thank everyone who's been involved with this. This is an enormous project, long coming, a lot of hard work and diligence that went into it, and thank you very much. Okay, agenda item 41 is... Agenda item 41 is case number LU-1609-10, application of Sweetwater at Largo for a change in land use from residential urban to residential medium. The public hearing was properly advertised. The affidavit of publication to be received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, I have one card from Kevin Besselo. Um, he's speaking in favor of it. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak against it? Or otherwise? Okay. I'll close the public hearing. Move approval. Second. Madam Chair. Yes. I don't need a presentation, but I did have a quick question on, okay. on the project. I don't know. Please. Renee or Glenn can answer it for you. Glenn Bailey zoning manager. Thank you. Uh, so this has expanded over time. They've expanded in property and density. Um, I just wanted to, there, and that's what tonight is, is the density. But we're not as far as what we do. That is a state regulation as far as the number of beds per space. Is that correct? That's the county regulations. Three times the uh, permitted density, the base density, which is in this case right now seven and a half. Three times that based on the acreage. And we go to 13, so I mean 15, then I make it 45 per acre. But as far as the operation of the assisted living facility itself? That's licensed by the state. Okay, all right. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I had a motion by Commissioner Gerard and a second by Commissioner Long. <clears throat> okay, that's unanimous approval. Uh, Agenda item 42. Agenda item 42 is case number CP 100619. This is proposed ordinance amending the future land use and quality communities element and the housing element of the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan. This is the second public hearing. The public hearing was properly advertised. The affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Letters of no objection have been received from the appropriate state agencies. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, this is the second hearing. Again, I have no cards, uh, blue cards for anyone signed up to speak for or against this agenda item. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to comment at this point? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Move approval. Second. A motion by Commissioner Gerard and second by Commissioner Peters. Okay, unanimous approval again. Uh, thank you also to everyone who's been involved with this. Um, this should help us to uh, build some more affordable and workforce housing. 
in our county and um, to help many people um, have adequate, safe, and nice housing. So, thank you. Okay, agenda item 43. Agenda item 43 is the proposed ordinance amending the Pinellas County Code regarding equine riding and seagrass, seagrass damage, excuse me. The public hearing was properly advertised. The affidavit of publication has been received for filing. There are 64 letters in support of and 320 letters in opposition to the proposed ordinance that have been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, we have um, many folks here in the audience that are either for or against. Um, I'd like a brief staff presentation. Um, Kelly Levy, so we got it. Oh, yeah. I think I got more. Good evening. Uh, Kelly I got Levy with Pinellas County Public Works, Division Director of Environmental Management. And I'm going to present an overview of, um, of the ordinance and, and some of the observations and activities going on. And, um, of course, answer any questions that we have along the way. Um, so what we're looking at here is, is both uh, recreational and commercial horseback riding within the aquatic preserve that has led to seagrass damage and violations of water quality standards related to bacteria. Um, these activities and the outcomes that we observed are, are inconsistent with a number of policies, including county ordinances, our, our permit that drives our stormwater program, our comprehensive plan, the estuary program management plan and and state best practices for equine activities the proposed ordinance here prohibits horseback riding uh, within the pinellas county aquatic preserve and also allows the county to address other activities that impact seagrasses so it's it's not just about the horse horseback riding but also any activity that would would damage the resource so I'm going to start off with um, some data that, you know, when collected in partnership with um, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the Florida Department of Health. And generally what was observed was that every time horseback riding was going on, um, the water was not clean. And that's just the way it is. It was not clean. The state standard for bacteria in this particular is, is 70. And more often than not, the standard was exceeded. And this type of bacteria has a strong link or correlation to gastrointestinal illness and can survive longer in the water than other types of bacteria. Um, the Florida Department of Health advises that when these types of bacteria are present in high concentrations in recreational water, so you're swimming, it's in your eyes, ears, nose, um, it may enter the skin through a cut or a sore, they may cause human disease, infections, or rashes. The state does have best practices for equine activities. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection, as well as the Department of Agriculture, publishes these documents that recommend that one, manure and urine create water quality and health hazards that you need to be aware of. Riding horses should occur a minimum of 25 feet from water bodies, and that horses should be kept out of natural waters to avoid erosion and water pollution issues. So these two state agencies, are their documents are consistent, and they are consi internally consistent, externally consistent, and um, this was their, their recommended um, best practices. I'm just going to look to towards some of the regulations at the state level. The, the state has Chapter 18-20, which oversees the Aquatic Preserve Program. Um, this, this Florida Administrative Code describes the intent behind creating creating the aquatic preserves and the activities that are supported and consistent with that intent, as well as the goal to discourage activities that degrade the system. Um, this regulation also requires that activities be regulated within the aquatic preserve and have criteria, including one to be, those activities need to be consistent with the aquatic preserve management plan. And they also have public interest criteria within the rule and this activity, the horseback riding, does not achieve those criteria. There are benefit categories and there are negative categories or cost categories. And this particular activity falls into the negative or, or the environmental cost activity, which also looks at cumulative impacts that have been observed. So I'm just going to go through a few aerials. And um, aerial imagery, you know, was reviewed. It's a standard practice for assessing, you know, seagrass health and abundance and coverage. 
Um, the state staff has also assessed impacts in this area, and I won't speak so much to that because Dr. Randy Runnels, the Boca Ciega Bay, Pinellas County, and Terracia Aquatic Preserve Manager is here, and he's going to speak to that specific damage that he has documented and observed. What we're looking at here is, you know, at the top box, you'll see that there are, you know, seagrasses there towards the shore. And then if, when you look at the intensive writing that have, for several years later, that seagrass is gone. And that's just generally the pattern. So where the writing is occurring, you know, we see scouring of seagrasses. We see tracks through the seagrasses. So again, on the left, you'll see an area, this is pre, before the intensive writing was occurring. And you have a thick seagrass bed. It's dense, it's full coverage. And then it's, it's being, um, you know, basically ridden through and, and um, scoured out. And then the same thing at, um, you know, on the top, again, is the pre-intensive where we have, you know, a full coverage of seagrass and the intensive writing showing where the seagrass has been damaged. So I want to go into some of our local requirements as well. The county operates under what's called a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit, or an NPDES permit. It governs our stormwater management activities. And that permit does require us to abate these types of discharges that violate state standards for water quality. And one of those items is animal waste. It's also important to note that per the Department of Environmental Protection, this area is already what's called not achieving standards for bacteria. Um, you know, and all of us working within the watershed, uh, when an area is not attaining standards and um, uh, we are required to what's implement what's called a, pollution, a bacteria pollution control plan to try to bring that area back into guidelines. And I'm going to, if we can switch over to the overhead, I just wanted to lay this, this one area down as well, just to recognize that um, this particular area is in a conditionally approved shellfish, shellfish harvesting area. So bacteria is going, to is going to impact that use as well. So it's another reason why we need to be um, careful about the bacteria sources in this area as it is a, a designated shellfish harvesting area. Kelly, yes. that, plant, that, that drawing again, could you just pull that back up? I'm sorry, I just didn't pick up on the two different areas there, the, the crosshatch and, the, and then the squared areas. Just what the distinction of the two is, please. Sure. I'm sorry. So the red, um, the red area, or it's, it's just straight lines, this is the prohibited area. Prohibited. So these are prohibited areas and then the green is the conditional um, conditionally approved shellfish harvesting area. Oh, shellfish harvesting. Yes. Okay. So we need to be protective of that use as well. All right, so I'm going to switch back to the presentation. Our current code, our surface water pollution protection ordinance, again, requires us to um, seek compliance with any discharge to our receiving waters of the county that's not entirely composed of stormwater. And any discharge that, um, that violates wa state water quality standards is prohibited. So arguably what's already going on is a problem with our code, and we need to address that. Our policies, you know, the county has, has um, very progressive policies within our comprehensive plan. It's tied to the Tampa Bay Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan for Tampa Bay to preserve, protect, conserve water quality in those aquatic habitats that they support, but also to show measurable improvements in the quality of our waters as a result of our management activities. And um, again, Ed Sherwood, the executive director of the estuary program, is here tonight, so he's going to, I'm sure, touch upon a lot of the goals of the estuary program and the CCMP, but I just have three of them here, is that, you know, seagrass is our keystone species in the bay, um, that controlling nitrogen inputs that the manure also contributes to is one of the most prominent initiatives that we have. It's tied to a regulatory mandate to um, control nitrogen discharges, um, and then also that the CCMP, the Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan, calls for managing recreational uses by eliminating sources of bacteria that are harmful to human and environmental health. And so I took a snapshot, um, you know, spent a lot of time in the municipal codes and calling a few governments to try to see, you know, what is going on around the state. And generally what you see in those things that are highlighted in green, those um, areas around the state and uh, prohibit horses being on the beach at all. Um, those in blue um, prohibit all animals from being on the beach. 
Um, and then there are some, some differences. So Bradenton, um, there is some horseback riding going on at Palmasola. In this particular case, the Manatee County Council of Governments have been discussing this issue. Um, the Department of Transportation, uh, it's a different district, they had asserted um, jurisdiction over that particular location, but they are revisiting that with the department to, to discuss that further. Um, in Broward County, um, they don't have any beach trails, but again, they have designated trails for horseback riding. A Flagler County, similar. Um, Manatee County, they don't actually have beaches. Um, the beaches are within their cities, but they do have designated trails for horseback riding. Um, and Lee County, again, doesn't allow horses on the beach, um, but they also have designated preserves for horseback riding. And then there are areas around the state that allow horseback riding on the beach, but not in the water. So those are um, on the north part of the East Coast in the Fernandina <coughs> Beach, also in the St. John's County area. And then in Gulf County, I found um, that they also have a designated area of beach where horseback riding is allowed. Um, it's not allowed in the water. It's above the mean high tide line. And then there's marked buffers. They have to have permits for that, cleanup activities, those types of Kelly, things. Kelly, yes. yes. Um, is St. Lucie in one of those counties, or is that a sec? Is that a separate county, St. Lucie County? I don't see it on the list. Yeah, I just uh, started kind of going around the state. I've okay. obviously I didn't know. I just I just know that St. Lucie either the it's either the city or the county right. does allow, but I, I didn't know if they allowed it in the water or not. They, they do. Could. I got pictures right here. Okay, they do if allow they it. If they allow it, I don't know. They, if they, they do. I got a picture right there. They do or do not? They do. They do. Yes. That's what I did I find a, a location where um, somebody advised that horseback riding was going in in the water, but the code prohibited it, so I wasn't sure about that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, again, when you look at the horseback riding opportunities in the in the Tampa Bay area, there are nearly 800 miles of de designated equestrian trails available for these uses. Um, Swift Med has 34 properties. Hillsborough County has over, over 100 miles of trails. Manatee County has 65. We have a number of, of equestrian opportunities in the county. So there's a lot, and these are all public opportunities. So there's a lot of opportunities um, available for equestrians in, in the Tampa Bay area. And this doesn't even include all the private opportunities. There's a lot of private properties that also offer various opportunities for riding. And so uh, what's been going on is, you know, once the, um, you know, once the uh, uh, public hearing was advertised, you know, uh, we posted at the Skyway location, we sent out emails to the stakeholders. Um, if the ordinance is approved tonight, the Department of Environmental Protection will be updating the Aquatic Preserve Management Plan, and all the stakeholders will be updated of, of an implementation process. We'll have a strong... Uh, presence out there, especially during the initial weeks of implementation. Um, the Department of Transportation will be uh, partnering with us as well, and uh, the Department of Environmental Protection has also advised that they are going to support any efforts that we, we need, and um, we'll coordinate with law enforcement agencies on, on enforcing as well. So with that, is there... Any questions for Kelly? Commissioner? Thank you. The uh, question we talked about last week at the briefing was about um, DEP's authority here and whether this would be um, an allowable function just under DEP rules. So I, I talked to the department, you know, and asked them for, you know, something formal versus you know, unfortunately, my contact at the department just left, and so my point of contact through this entire thing is gone. <laughs> so I had to kind of go up the chain to find, you know, who else knew about this and who could provide me some information, and they called me back today. And so they wanted to be assured that this issue was, you know, when this issue was first brought to their attention, they took it to the Office of General Counsel, and there was some question as to who should actually enforce this Department of Transportation because they own, operate, and manage the causeway, or the Department of Environmental Protection because of the adjacent aquatic preserve. While those conversations were going on, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Health met and were talking about other, other alternatives outside the regulatory framework to try to halt the activity. They talked about roping off the entire area and having designated areas where people could come through but the horses would not be allowed. Um, that's when they started implementing the monitoring 
Um, the Department of Health, again, at that point in time, made the recommendation that the signs be posted out there because of the public health concerns. Um, they said while that, um, those discussions and planning were going on, um, I sent them the draft ordinance for consideration. And at that point in time, they had an internal conversation to kind of pause because they felt like the ordinance was a more holistic approach to addressing the issue and that they would continue to support us. Um, you know, they, they're still committed to some of those other things, roping off areas, the signage. Um, they've asked us to uh, contract with them to perform monitoring because this, is, this area is so extensively used by a broad use of, of recreational activities that they want to ensure that the water quality out there is, meets those, those recreational standards because there's swimming, there's paddle boarding, there's kite surfing, there's just people just boating, there's kayaking. Um, and so they want to make sure that those that the area is safe. And so they're working. They've asked to contract with us to perform that service for them. They did um, want me to say that um, to convey that the department fully supports these actions and that they will assist us in the implementation um, as much as they can. So that was the message that I received. <coughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> just to to the extent that there are are other things that go on in the, in the bay that, that affect the seagrass. Uh, I, don't so, I don't think so much the other issue, uh, um, the, the, the water quality issue. Um, but it, 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 say, for instance, they, they, we said you can do it on Sunday and Wednesday. So you can't do it seven days a week, but you can do it two days a week. What kind of uh, rebound to the seagrass does it have and um, and then what kind of issues as far as the water quality dissipate you know dissipating and, and coming back to normal I mean it's one extreme or the other it seems like it, it not nothing in between so I'm just wondering about a two day a week kind of thing just your, your thoughts well, on that. one my perspective would be I charged with enforcing an ordinance that I would have to enforce and the waste cannot enter the water the manure and the urine cannot enter the water so that would still be a problem. Um, it's an inconsistency. We can't, you know, enforce our code over here on this individual blowing grass clippings in the water and then allow this to happen and not do it. So there's the, that would be a problem. I still would argue that that's inconsistent with state law, and I can defer to the county attorney if they want to chime in on any of that. I would argue that it would actually be more problematic because if we said, okay, horses only on Monday, it would be all horses, and we could go from having 16 horses to having 30 horses. So it, 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 the seagrass need a lot of time to restore. This isn't going to happen overnight. This is going to happen over years. And so if it's just chronically impacted, it's not going to result in a positive outcome. Um, the, again, the public health issue, it would basically be, again, my opinion, be authorizing an exclusive use on that day because it wouldn't be safe for anyone else. It would not be safe for anyone Thank else. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. So, um, you know, take the horses out of this. When we do water testing, let's say in Gulfport, and there's high fecal content, most of the time it's from birds. It's from other mammals like manatees, dolphins, if they're all around in that area when we're testing. Is that not correct? Well, there are different bacteria that are more prevalent in different animals. So um, there can be testing done. Basically, if you have a chronic source of bacteria and you're not sure of the source, you can do um, what's called microbial source tracking, and we can actually look at the DNA of the bacteria, and right. it will tell you where it comes from. Yeah, so and so we have other areas in the bay where we have problems with bacteria from other mammals and birds, take the horses out of it, and we still have the chronic problem anyway. So it's something in nature that happens regardless. Isn't that correct? Because I know Gulfport, I know Gulfport had that problem, and they couldn't do anything until they got the report back to con con uh, confirm that it was birds or mammals. They didn't know if it was the dog park or whatever it was. Um, but it happens in the bay. Take the horses out of it. It still happens in the bay regardless because of the sea life, the bird life, and the dog life, correct? Well, it happens from a variety of sources, but not chronically. I mean, it may be that it rains and there's a wash off of material in two areas. And yes, there's going to be exceedances, but it's not every single day okay. that an activity is going on. So I would, I would disagree with that. Anyone? Questions at this point? 
Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> um, we will call you up individually. I'll try to call several people up at a time. And um, you do have three minutes to speak. Um, if you could please state your name and address, that would be helpful. And we will start with Jim Swain. And thereafter, it'll be Charles Cole. And then Carol Feltz. Thank you. Hi, right. good evening. I'm Jim Swain. Um, I live downtown now, just moved uh, from Terra Verde, lived out there 24 years. You visited our property a couple years ago uh, with the dock things. But anyways, I've been a, I've, I've been, I spent 24 years on those flats as a fisherman, as a father, and, um, you know, we have a dog park in Fort DeSoto that has 6,000 dogs a week, right, two miles from where these horses ride. So I think it's a, it's a question of balance in terms of how many horses we have and all the other activities. Um, we've done a great job, um, nationally recognized, internationally recognized in restoration of our, our waters. And um, we've had recovery of seagrasses almost doubled in the last 20 years. Um, but most of the damage to the seagrasses out there, it's boats, propeller scars, groundings, um, kite boarding. Um, so in terms of the scarring, if you go north from the Terra Verde Bridge, the same pictures that Miss Levy showed, uh, you can see the same type of damage. And there's never been a horse there. It's the kite boarders. So there's other issues that I, I think we're unproportionately proposing to penalize right, people who like riding horses. And it's a unique experience um, when all other types of, I don't think we're looking for balance. Um, in terms of the, the water quality, what Miss Levy talked about really wasn't science, it was observation. There's one, there's one bacteria that they use kind of as an indicator in the same time period that, um, and all we were given in the county's report was, was days. So not times, not tides. But and Madeira Beach was issuing a public advisory. So we have water quality issues all over the bay. And they move. It's not, it's not static. It's dynamic. So I just encourage the commissioners to reject uh, the proposal. I think it needs more study. Um, uh, maybe there's uh, some common ground or some compromise to be had here. Thank you. Charles Cole. Good evening, commissioners. Um, give me one second to kind of get set up here. So I'm Charles Cole III. I'm from Mayaka City. I'm a graduate from Maker College, and I'm an engineer. So my view might be a little bit different, and I'm also a horse owner. I'll disclose that. So um, going through this packet from staff, I found... It just, when you use 10 tests in five different days, it is, it is unconclusive evidence. It doesn't make any sense. You have to have at least 30 points to have any kind of statistical data. And then you have to, you can't just pick this one spot. You have to pick areas all over the place as far as the, um, the eco um, bacteria goes. Um, and I have some sites that are pulled with different water quality um, issues all around Florida. And when you go here to these slides that she has with some squares on them and some ovals, it's very nice to see squares and ovals, but there's no dates. So I have no idea what this means. And I'm not sure if FDT did this or the, um, the FDEP, but I have a thing from SwiftMud that I've printed out and I will give to you guys. It's 54 pages and it goes through all kinds of maps and they're very colorful printed and um, and there's waxes and wanes in the seagrass that it's just natural if there's a storm that comes through it covers it up with grass then it pops back up and um, that's just how seagrass is you know and if there's a lot of destruction to the seagrass then it will take some time for it to come back yes but um, I don't see how the horses just walking through would be any different than boat scarring 
or, or any other activity, even people walking through the seagrass is going to cause some damage to it. So what I would recommend is, is having like a third party really look at the data before this is passed because like given the data that I was given from your website, it just, if I was going to make this decision, I just wouldn't have enough information to make a decision today. And that's all I have, guys. Don't clap. Don't clap. <coughs> Sorry. Carol Feltz, who's also a guest, uh, and then I realized I was giving these out of order and I need to go with proponents first according to our rules. Oops. So, but we'll. Hi, I'm Carol Feltz. I'm also from Mayaka City. And I'm also a ninth generation Florida native. And I can guarantee you that my ancestors came riding horses up on the shores of this state. And I believe that horseback riding is a natural event that takes place in a natural environment. Horses are doing nothing different than they've done for years and years. The difference is that we have paved our state with asphalt where we've forgotten that we were a beautiful natural environment and there still are those of us who enjoy natural activities. And I find it to be very interesting that we can have the backing of scientific uh, studies from within our own government and yet be so blind that we're picking on a small group of people who are still enjoying a natural activity. The horse, there are many places in the United States where horses are used for recreation. We have designated trails. There are designated trails for the seagrass. It would be amiss to say that we have a large horseback riding community. We're losing our land. We're losing our places to ride every day. We're losing our jobs that allow us to have horses anymore. It's not a cheap hobby. And it seems a little comical in a way when we look at sewage spills phosphate mines, air pollution, and we're picking on horses. Don't we all feel a little bit silly about trying to deal with something when there's a much bigger picture in the world we need to be looking at than a small group of people that are being discriminated against for enjoying a natural hobby in a natural environment that I guarantee you has more respect for the environment of this state than anyone else that's out there. And I think we should be recognized for that. Thank you. Um, I would respectfully ask, um, we try to maintain decorum here, and it's not booing or cheering for either side, because um, we want to listen to each one of you patiently and kindly. So next is um, uh, Randy Reynolds, and then thereafter is Todd Bibza, and then Jessica Bibza. Did we switch to the pros now? Or? I are we Acts, they were given to me out of order, okay. so I just put them back okay. into order. We are now doing the proponents. Okay. Um, we will then do the undecideds, and then we will do the opponents. Sorry. Hi. My name is Randy Runnels. I manage the aquatic preserves around Tampa Bay for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm here with their knowledge and their permission. Um, I don't want to repeat what other people have been saying, but I wanted to... Uh, share my observations on the damage, the nature of the damage that's, that's being done. And I've been uh, looking at this for um, over two years, I guess, since we first realized what was going on. And um, did snorkel for a while there, and I got decided that it wasn't good for myself or my staff to snorkel. Um, so in those areas, um, we got to the point where we decided not to do that. But uh, we, we've been directly observing a couple of types of damage to the seagrass. And, and a big question that I had early on was, would this just be damage from boats or other activities in the area? And so I uh, put a lot of thought into this and looked at other areas nearby and around the bay. Um, there's, uh, first of all, there's damage to the shallow uh, shoals where the sand is hard packed. And um, those typically have shoal grass, the thinner seagrass on them and uh, it's a little more opportunistic. It can, it can uh, reestablish a lot more quickly than the other, but if it's not there for very long, then you have the susceptibility of that shoal to storms and things that might blow parts of it out. So it is good to have it on those shoals. And that's where we see the line linear wear in the aerial photos. Kelly showed some from the Gulf side. 
Uh, there's also uh, similar wear in a big area on the, on the um, excuse me, she showed from the bay side. On the gulf side, there's similar, uh, a big area of similar wear. And so um, the, the wear is in these striations that are parallel to, uh, yeah, parallel to the, the shoals. And when we look nearby or even across the bay at shoals that, um, that parallel what we call boat traffic sheds, the boaters don't really go on the shallow water. They stay on the, uh, in the deep water as, as much as they can. They only go in the shallow water when they have to, or if they do, they don't do that over and over again the hundreds of times that we see the striations on the shallow shoals. So it really isn't consistent with boat prop scarring or any kind of watercraft where they typically, um, a lot of the scars, a big percentage, go uh, at right angles to the shoal. So looking at all that, I know that gets a little geeky, but, um, but it really, after over 20 years of looking at shoals and scarring and all, this doesn't look like watercraft scarring, and, and it's definitely right along where the horses ride. The other damage that is not as apparent, you can't see from the aerial photos, when you snorkel on the, snorkel on the turtle grass beds, which are deeper, um, and um, turtle grass is more blade-like, it tends to um, trap sediment, and the sediment's a lot softer and, and uh, more easily penetrated than the hard sand on the shallow shoals. You get what looks like somebody took a post hole digger and punched holes in there. And I can put my hand down in there and feel the rhizomes of the, the, the turtle grass has big rhizomes that are really important to the integrity of the seagrass bed. And, um, and I can feel the rhizomes sticking out, sometimes brittle because they're, they're dead. And so there is considerable damage that you don't see unless you get in the water and actually look closely and feel in the turtle grass beds. That's not really apparent on, on the aerials. So there are really two types of seagrass damage there. And um, I've never seen anything else punch holes like that in the, in the seagrass beds in the soft sediment part. So um, I'm, I'm convinced that it's basically that, that, that it's the horseback riding that's producing the, the bulk of the damage we see out there. You always see some stray prop scars and this and that, but you don't really see boat traffic sheds where boats are you know, coming up to the shore there very often at all. In places where boats frequent those shoals more, and similar shoals, you see a different pattern of scarring. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Todd Bibsa? She's going to speak instead. Okay. I can hear the name. I'm sorry. And then if I go, to you are Jessica. I'll just take some. Yeah, exactly. Hi there. I'm Jessica Bibza, and I'm with National Wildlife Federation. I also live in Placido Bayou uh, in St. Petersburg. Um, I wore blue to support the bay, but I see I didn't coordinate with the other side. Um, I am a member of Tampa Bay Estuary Program's Technical Advisory Council. I'm also the chair of a brand new form Pensacola Perdido Estuary Program in Northwest Florida. And we have consistently looked to the Tampa Bay Estuary Program as our model of how we want to do things in Pensacola. Um, I know several of you are very familiar with the work of the estuary program, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the importance of the seagrass. I think that you all know about setting the targets and achieving those targets. But, um, you know, really want to stress that it was really the work of many, many individuals taking a lot of small actions and some big actions that resulted in the recovery that we see today. It was things like, you know, yes, the city of Tampa wastewater treatment, but also scoop your poop plans, the fertilizer ordinance, and for stopping people from blowing their clippings into the drains, the mark your drain programs. It was a lot of efforts of many, many individuals. That is why this ordinance is needed. There's been a very well-documented issue and there's a clear solution. I agree, I read a lot of comments that they submitted and I agree that there are a lot of other issues that also need to be addressed. The beauty of this ordinance is it is going to give the county and the staff the ability to address more than just the horseback riding. Anything that's causing damage to the seagrass, they'll now be able to address. So kudos to the staff for putting together such a great ordinance. I also, I, I heard some um, criticisms, I guess, of the science, and I just, again, I am, I am a marine biologist, work Moat Marine Lab, Ocean Conservancy, all National Wildlife Federation. I have 100% confidence in the science that the staff has done. Um, uh, Ed Sherwood, the executive director of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program is here. He's a science background. I'm sure he'll attest to the, the science as well. Um, as far as the, the economic impacts, the studies have shown that one in five jobs in this area are directly tied to the health of the bay. There's documentation that this activity threatens the health of the bay, maybe just in a small spot, but again, many, many people are making a lot of efforts. I don't know why this one activity should be exempt. 
Um, I've read recent posts that said come by and check out the horseback riding. I rode my bike by there two weeks ago right before we had the rain and the stench was overwhelming. Um, I just, uh, you know, this is not a, an anti-horseback riding uh, ordinance. I love horses. I love riding. I've been out riding in Mayaka City and Eastern Hillsboro, but that's the place the activity should be taking place, not in Tampa Bay, not threatening a valuable resource that we've all invested a lot of time and energy and money to restore. Thank you. Okay. Roger Wilson? Oh, he's the one. oh you're going to speak to? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm Todd Bibbs. I also live in Placido Bayou in, in St. Petersburg. Um, I'm here to, uh, to support the ordinance um, as uh, somebody who enjoys the water, swimming, um, boating, and so forth. Uh, I think it's important to you know, have a healthy bay and to be able to enjoy that because that's a, that's, the bay is for water sports. You know, horses, love horses, ridden horses before, always done it on land. Um, you know, there was uh, you know, a little bit of... Uh, I guess the point taken at, oh, well, other things make um, waste and so forth in the water. Well, like manatees, dolphins, well, that's where they live. Where else are they going to go? They're not land animals, okay? Horses are land animals, okay? So, you know, although I looked at the picture, wow, that really looks like fun to, you know, but it, not to the expense of damaging what we have, okay? Climate change, all this stuff like that, the science and so forth. You know, nobody wants to believe it until it's too late. This is something small that we can start with and then we continue on with, okay? We can't all of a sudden solve it all in one, in one fell swoop. So let's start with something we can do and then build from there. Thank you. Thank you. Roger Wilson. Thank you. Hello, sir. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> You know, I, I feel like this started in 1968, maybe before some of you were born, but uh, I, I hear the same things, a little bit here and a little bit there, and somebody else is doing something wrong, so we can do it too, you know. And the bottom line is uh, there are no uh, bridal paths in the aquatic preserves. You think about that. There are none, and it revolves around the health issue, the damage issue, and you can't justify having horseback riding just because birds go to the bathroom. I, you know, that, that doesn't fit. Uh, I want to make a point about the shape of Florida. If you walk around the state of Florida, just casually following the outline, it'll cover about 1,100 miles. But if you follow the tidal flow, all of a sudden it jumps up to more than 8,000 miles. That plus the land bridle pass would give any horseback rider more than sufficient opportunity to ride a horse in some place other than an aquatic preserve. The aquatic preserve was established to repair, restore, and protect the damage that had been done as a result of dredging and filling. Moving forward, we now have to contend with overflowing sewage treatment uh, services. We have to deal with horseback riding, you know, and we have to deal with the fact that there's more trash in the water today. Uh, the finger fills contribute to the collection of trash, because if you go to the top of a, a finger fill uh, in the canal, you'll see a lot of times up and down. Trash is floating up and down. And that's because as a result of all the uh, dredging and filling, we no longer have a flushing tidal flow. It's up and down. And when the Bayway went in and all the dredging that went in with around that, uh, or in addition to that, uh, that was kind of like the cork in the mouth of Tampa Bay. And so we have manure floating in the water. And I've been out under, I've seen this firsthand. The manure floats. And the urine from the horse just, you know, moves around with the current of the wind. And the horse maybe two or three hundred yards off the coastline, but the manure comes in and lands on the beach. And I, I saw a young lady, with it. she had a bucket and, then a, and a fish uh, scoop uh, net, and she was going around trying to catch all the manure. Uh, and she was only partly successful. But the bottom line is, uh, this is not good. It doesn't fit. 
And the statute, quite frankly, the Aquatic Preserve statute does not allow it. And, and bear with me, I want to read this to you just to make sure you realize what was done back in 1969. It's hard to believe that that was done back at that time. Uh, it is the intent of the legislature that such bodies of water be preserved insofar as possible in an essentially natural condition so that their ecological and aesthetic values may endure for the enjoyment of future generations, your children and grandchildren. And I would ask you to support this uh, proposal, this uh, ordinance, uh, because it's very much necessary. And I'll yield to any questions that somebody may have. Thank you. No? It was nice to celebrate the 50th anniversary well, with you. I, all. I, I still can't get over that. that <laughs> when they called and asked me about that, I said, wait a minute, 50 years? How can that be? I'm only 37, you know? I but, know. <laughs> the, the math doesn't work, you know? Uh, it was quite, a, quite an honor. And, it, uh, and I was really surprised when uh, Chris still gave me one of his numbered, printed uh, uh, paintings. Uh, it uh, was just overwhelming. But here we are, you know, 50 years later, still talking about trying to hold on to an aquatic preserve concept. Why? It should be automatic. It's not just for y'all. It's for your children and grandchildren. And who wants to swim near or around uh, horse manure? It happens. There's a real serious health hazard here. Thank, Thank you. you. And Paul? Who? And then thereafter, John Hood. And thereafter, Heather Young. Hello. Hi. My name is Ann Paul. I'm a biologist working for Audubon, Florida's Coastal Island Sanctuaries, managing bird nesting habitat along the west coast of our state. I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning thinking, today I'm going to damage important resources in the Tampa Bay system. And I don't think that the horseback riders or the people that rent the horses to them think that. But the fact is, we have seen real proof, actually documented proof, that this practice does damage the resources of our precious water, causing pollution, and our sea grasses that can actually damage that can actually be seen from space and even impacts the other users of the area so that they can enjoy an area where this practice is going on. So please approve this ordinance and stop this particular incremental damage of the resources of Pinellas County and Tampa Bay. Thank you very much. Thank you. John Hay. <clears throat> Uh, good evening. My name is Dr. John Sudler Hood, and I think I know most of everybody up there. Um, I am here to speak in support of the ordinance. We have input from FDEP, FDOT, FDOH, FDACS, the Aquatics Preserves, all stating that this is a good ordinance and should be in place. In fact, with the horseback riding that's going on now, I think they're probably in violation of the law. Uh, they could probably be prosecuted under existing law. This just further uh, <clears throat> enforces what we're able to do. Uh, the information is science-based. All these offices or organizations have uh, PhDs on their staff. In order to get a PhD, minimum eight years out of high school, okay? These are not stupid people. You might say, well, it's not rocket science. It is. It's probably more complex than a lot of rocket science. Uh, these are brilliant people on these committees and they support the ordinance. Uh, the city of St. Petersburg supports it. Uh, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council supports it. Uh, and I didn't realize that there are people harvesting shellfish out in the bay. Well, we got a shellfish here and a poop ball floating by. I don't think that would be a healthy thing to eat. 
uh, my son swims in that area. I'm not so happy about that, but there's not a whole lot I can do about it. We have documented increase in enterococci, nitrogen, phosphate, and uh, damage to the seagrass, all of it documented on a scientific basis. Uh, horses, by the way, are an invasive species. They're brought here by the Spanish. They are not native. Neither are cats or dogs, but we all have them. But they need to be utilized and treated properly. And galloping a multi-hundred ton animal through delicate seagrass is not an appropriate use of that animal. So I would encourage you to uh, support and pass this ordinance. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Young. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Heather Young. I'm a resident of Clearwater, Florida, and today I am here representing the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, where I am the environmental planner. I have 15 years experience in the realm of coastal management, where most of my focus has been in habitat restoration, conservation, mapping, and water quality. Established by law, aquatic preserves are exceptional areas of submerged lands and associated waters that are to be maintained in their natural or existing conditions. The intent was to forever set aside these submerged lands with exceptional biological, aesthetic, and scientific values for the benefit of future generations. Water testing has shown increases in fecal indicator bacteria measurements in the area the horses are ridden, which can lead to recreational beach closers. These standards are set to keep the public safe while enjoying traditional recreational activities such as fishing, swimming, and boating. The same nutrients that make manure good for composting are now being directly deposited into the waters of the aquatic preserve. The nutrients and bacteria are the same things our local governments are working incredibly hard to reduce from the public stormwater and wastewater systems. Due to the hard work of our local governments through much public investment, Tampa Bay's water is much cleaner than in decades past. The clean water has allowed our seagrass to rebound. And I'm purposely saying our seagrass because this is due to the forethought and efforts of elected officials throughout the region through a lot of intergovernmental collaboration. <clears throat> the culmination of these efforts have made Tampa Bay a success story the rest of the country strives to recreate. When these same local governments undertake projects in the Bay that impact seagrasses, they must mitigate those damages, again, using public funds. Given that these operations are occurring without permission or oversight, there is no accountability that seagrass or water quality are not being impacted. In aerial imagery, the nearshore seagrass beds clearly show the paths commonly used by horses as they move from the trailering beach to the sandbar. Horses are large animals, Field experts have described the physical damage being caused by seagrass as analogous to using a post hole digger in your, in your lawn. Not all activities are appropriate in all locations. We want to encourage appropriate uses in appropriate areas. The reality of the situation is that there are plenty of other land-based public places for these horses to be ridden and operations to continue. The Agency on Bay Management is the natural resources arm of the Regional Planning Council, comprised of representatives of all levels of government around Tampa Bay, along with regionally and nationally renowned natural resource professionals. As a matter of public record, the overwhelming consensus was that this particular use of the aquatic preserve is in conflict with the existing and intended uses. It's easy to be swayed by the emotional arguments that this is all for the therapy of horses. Pinellas County has a long history of making decisions based on science for the benefit of the resources that belong to all of us. And I know you have the tenacity to continue the legacy and approve the proposed ordinance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandra Chapetta? Chapetta, yes. <laughs> How y'all doing tonight? Good. 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 Hello. All right. My name is Sandra Chapetta, and I live in South Pasadena. And I want to say thank you for hearing me talk about the seagrass tonight. So many living mangrove shorelines, oyster banks, and seagrass beds were lost in Pinellas County during the dredge and fill heyday of rapid development that protecting every little bit that we have left is no longer optional. 
Cumulative damage over time from many sources increases stress to the seagrass beds bit by bit until they reach a tipping point and collapse, like recently happened in Biscayne Bay, Florida Bay, and the Indian River Lagoon. Now those communities are scrambling to meet the need to generate hundreds of millions of dollars. Let me repeat that. Hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenue for attempted rest restoration of their lost seagrass beds. Many tiny cumulative stressors threaten seagrass spreads, some large and natural, such as hurricanes, e increasing bay water temperatures and changes in salinity, and some man-made, aging leaking sewage lines and septic tanks, boat wave turbidity clouds near seawalls, along with nutrient-laden runoff in heavily populated areas that reduces water clarity and increases harmful algae blooms, trampling by the horses, anchoring and boat prop scarring, fertilizer use in combination with nutrient-laden reclaimed water, and loss of natural mangrove shorelines and oyster beds to waterfront developments. In addition, many boaters and the people riding the horses are unaware of the important role of seemingly bare living benthic bottom, seagrass tufts, and rhizome roots that extend far out horizontally from the main visible edge of the seagrass bed. These areas are even more easily damaged and seeds buried too deep to germinate by activities such as trampling, anchoring, prop scarring, digging, and powerboat and jet ski washout. Seagrass, living mangrove shorelines, and oyster banks all work together to filter and clean our water to increase water clarity, protect recreational water quality, and prevent harmful algae blooms. Reducing as many man-made cumulative negative impacts, no matter how small as possible, allows our marine ecosystems to better handle the large natural stressors that we have no control over. Restoring and protecting our shared resources improve water clarity, which then allows seagrass beds to regenerate on their own with no cost to us, and expand improving water quality and recreational water quality even more. We need to do more to protect our seagrasses, even if it's just one tiny spot to allow them to regenerate because there are many, many other areas like where I live in South Pasadena where the seagrass does struggle due to loss of water clarity from excess nutrient runoff. So in an area like that where the horses are degrading by running through there and trampling those rhizomes, they're breaking up those seagrass beds and those take years and even decades to recover and we need every bit that we have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Sheen Todd, who is a former county commissioner for our county. Welcome. Welcome. It's awesome to stand in front of you, and I know how difficult decisions are, particularly when you know they're negative and positive reactions. Having been a horse owner myself, I respect um, the initiative to want to offer more opportunities, and I truly believe that the intent is not malicious but I'm here to support the ordinance that your staff has developed, not just as a former county official, but as the current chair of the Agency on Bay Management, which is one of the committees of the Regional Planning Council. We had a hearing in which we invited the various scientists as members of the group as well to give us the input as to what action we should take and what we should recommend to you. We had very extensive discussion and ultimately the decision was made. I was directed to send a letter to the Department of Environmental Protection asking them to fully support you, your ordinance, whatever you come up with, because I have full faith you're going to come up with the right thing, whatever it is. It shows my faith in you. But also uh, to let people know that we really looked into this issue. It wasn't just having a few people come by and give an opinion. We had the top grade scientists represented there. As a matter of curiosity, some of my children and grandchildren hearing me talk about this said, well, Mimo, that's what they call me, <laughs> what is an aquatic preserve? So I went online, which is where you find all your answers naturally, and it said, simply put, aquatic preserves protect the living waters of Florida to ensure that they will always be home for breeding birds, fish nurseries, freshwater springs, salt marshes, seagrass meadows, and mangrove forests. And that's just the beginning of many of our other industries. I totally understand why the people who have horseback riding opportunities have them. I hope that maybe this points out the fact that 
perhaps our counties need to be looking for other horseback trail opportunities, but definitely your regional planning council and your agency on bay management are totally supportive of the ordinance that's been put before you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we um, will go for the opponents and we'll go back to that. Um, I did ask earlier at the very beginning of this, some of you have been good about it and some of you have forgotten, but a gentle reminder that we would like to have your name and address for the public record. Uh, Kathy Wolf. Hi, my name is Kathy Wolf. I live at 17950 State Road 62 in Parrish, Florida. I am a horse owner. I am also, I have a business taking people trail riding. I do not take my horses on the, on the Skyway as a business. I've gone a couple of times for fun. Um, eight years ago, Manatee County decided they did not want horses at the Palm Sole Causeway. Same issues, seagrass, bacteria in the water. First, they decide, found out that the horses were not damaging the seagrass at the Palm Sole Causeway, which is much smaller than the area at the Skyway. All of the bacteria studies that they did actually showed that the water on the south side of the causeway, where there were no horses, had higher levels of bacteria than water on the north side of the causeway where we take the horses. Yes, horse poops, horses do poop in the water. Horses are pooping grass, hay, and grain. I have watched manatees follow my horses at the Pomacilla Causeway and eat their poop as it's coming out their back ends. It's a food source for them. We have had dolphins swimming beside us while we were in the Pomacilla Causeway. It disintegrates, like with a matter of moments. It disintegrates. There's nothing there. Um, horses in Florida are over a $6 billion a year industry. There are a lot of horse people in Florida. We are very passionate about our horses. Uh, I heard somebody say something about the waters were meant for natural things. What's more natural than a horse? They're more natural than a boat. They're more natural than a kiteboarder. They're more natural than almost anything else that's out there in the Tampa Bay. Boats are gonna leak gas, they're gonna leak oil. People are dumping stuff in the water. Yes, it's a problem, but I don't believe that the horses are the main issue. When they're doing the samples, are they doing them at the same time every day? Are they doing them in the same place every day? Or are they falling along behind the horses and taking the water, which of course it's gonna have a higher bacteria count. I know they say they're experts, and I believe they're experts, but I also believe that they're biased towards getting the horses out of the Tampa Bay. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Osterling, and then thereafter David Putnam. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jennifer Osterling. I live at 40035 Clay Gully Road, Myaka City, Florida. I was born and raised in Manatee County, and I've been riding horses probably before I can walk. I did bring a few things. I'm going to jump around just a little bit because of everything I've heard behind me. So I'm going to lay out a few things. I'm going to start out by telling you a few things. I'm an active member of the Florida Cracker Trail Association of 22 years. I was also a former trail boss, meaning I took 350 riders across the state of Florida on the 25th anniversary. Um, I'm still an active member. I'm just not the trail boss anymore. I was for that for four years. Um, I do bring my personal horses. I have four horses I bring out to the Tampa Bay area at times. But I also would like to tell you that I work for Sea Ponies. I am one of the current guides for Sea Ponies. I've been there three and a half years, the longest guide there. And maybe I can give you a little perspective on a few things. Um, I've, I went through some of the paperwork here. This is all a bag of garbage, by the way, that I pick up on the beach every day. I would like to talk about some assets of why we're there as well. Um, when we're riding through the ocean, on this little paper here that they are mapping out, um, they've got the boxes here. We follow a very deep water trail. This might help a little because I am a guide and I'm out there every day and I see everything going on. Um, I try to take a very deep path of sand. It's water, deep water and sand. So I drop the horses about chest deep and as I go out, I'm staying out of the seagrass because I know the importance of, of the seagrass and I love the ocean. I've grown up in the ocean my whole life and fished my whole life as well. 
So as I follow that path um, and I get out to the sandbar, I stay on the sand. Do a little spiel, talk about you know environmental things at times. I try to educate the public about cleaning up the beaches. There's lots of balloons that people leave out there, uh, water bottles, trash. You can imagine this can kill sea turtles. So we're doing a good thing by being there also, I, I feel. And um, I'm always educating everybody, especially kids, which also, you know, People come to us out there that have cancer, and I have ex-veteran, Vietnam veterans, that are hugging me when I, they leave the ride with me, saying thank you for such a wonderful time to get to experience something that you might not ever get to do again because you might be dead tomorrow. And I mean, some of these people have actually hugged me. I, sorry, I get a little emotional. And, you know, because I'm learning, you know, I, I've become friends with many of these people. So I, we're not out there trying to damage the seagrass whatsoever. We have one small little area, and I mapped it out, that I use. Because I, I know the importance, you know, of the seagrass as well. And also, um, I did do a little research myself. Because I do ride through many, many preserves in the state of Florida. As a Cracker Trail member, I also go into Georgia. And I have 32 preserves that I have here for you. And several are ocean preserves that we are allowed to ride in with horses. And we're only asking for a small little part there. I don't think we're hurting anything by it. Um, so I did bring some hay. This is what horses eat. It's organic. This is a little bit of horse poop, yes, but it is organic and it does dissolve in water. It's just like hay. When you cut your grass, it blows away. So it does not, I really feel it's not hurting anything. And um, if you want to take a look at these, there's 32 preserves and some of them are ocean preserves that you, we can ride in. And on Frederick Douglass Pierce on the East Coast, I have friends that do that over there as well and they ride in the ocean as well, and there's no issues there. Thank so, you. Thank you. I know I was jumping out a little. <laughs> David Putnam. Hello. Hi. My name is David Putnam. Uh, I, put, I have two addresses. One is in Mayaco, one is in Nokomis, and the one I wrote down is Nokomis, but I live at um, 14800 Sugar Bowl, Sugar Bowl Road. And I'm going to be real short because I, my friend took more time. So I, I just want to say that I've, I'm a horse owner too. Um, I don't ride as often as I'd like to. Uh, I'm getting to know the, the people at Sea Ponies, and I, I've seen the uh, the work that they do, and I see the, the consciousness that they have. Um, I'm, I'm worried about some of the things that have been said about this is the first step this ordinance has, is that the, we're going to start with the horses, and then we're going to go on. The, the kite boarders should be here too, because that they're next, because those shallow striations they're all right along the wind. They're all going to the same place. The, the horses don't, horses take steps. They don't make cuts. The, the kite boarders make the cuts. So before we, before you guys jump into it, I think that you should take some more time to investigate it a little more. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly. Cat. Kimberly, with a K. I'm sorry, I can't read the next letter. Cult. I see it down in the email. No, K-U-L-T, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. Uh, first of all, I'm going to be speaking for the group, um, for a group of us. I'd like to thank you all for allowing us to speak. Um, to begin, I'd like to address the water quality concerns. Excuse me, how many... People, do you have speaking? How many people are you speaking for? Um, five. Five. She does. Um, mm -hmm. I just. And we're just get, looking for do that. Do you want card. me to wait? No, no. Go no, ahead. No, no. Okay. Um, the five that you are representing. Well, they myself please? and four others. Would Pardon you like me? them to stand? Yeah, you're the yeah. other four. Yeah. Can you stand up you and show up? that you're present? Thank you. So she does get ten, ten minutes. minutes. Right. And I where just are you, where you, take the where are you from? Minutes. Okay. So um, my name is Kimberly Colt, and my address is four sixty four. Northview Street, Port Charlotte, Florida, 33954. Okay, I actually do represent Sea Ponies. I work for the Sea Ponies, but I'd like to address some of your issues. Um, thank you for hearing us 
to start with, but concerning the water quality and horse manure, uh, it might not, you might not be aware that the EPA excludes horse manure from solid waste regulation because it does not contain significant amounts of hazardous chemicals and exhibits no hazardous characteristics. From January 2019 to August 10th, 2019, nearly 400,000 gallons of raw sewage was dumped into Tampa Bay waters by Pinellas, Hillsboro, Pasco, and Manatee County governments. This number represents only the reported spills. It is six times more than the total number of all 2018. Sewage spills, in my opinion, are the primary contributor to the degradation of water quality not the horses. Moving on to the seagrass preservation and scarring. First of all, I'd like to mention most horse people are strong environmentalists. We want to keep our natural habitat. We want to keep our country. We want to keep our beaches, OK? So we are very um, strong in defense of that seagrass. We do our best to stay out of it. Um, over, over 30,000 acres of seagrass have been scarred by boat propellers slashing into the bottom substrate. Tampa Bay is in the top four areas represent representing this boat damage. Many of these beds may never recover. No matter what we do, these beds might not, might not ever recover. According to Florida Fish and Wildlife, over 100,000 boats are registered in Pinellas, Hillsboro, and Manatee counties. That's potential for a lot of boat scarring damage not horses. Aerial views that Ms. Kelly has provided, and I know that you all have seen, um, provide concise evidence of the scarring. If you look at the area in which the horses are and compare that with the aerial view over in um, Isla del Sol, just to the north of us where we ride, you'll see there's no significant difference. Yet there are no horses in Isla del Sol no horse-related activities there whatsoever. Concerning the community, Sea Ponies has multiple repeat riders who travel from as far as the UK to experience this ride. According to TripAdvisor, we are currently the number one outdoor activity in Pinellas County. Our customers stay in Pinellas County hotels. They spend their resources at the downtown area restaurants, museums, and local attractions. Locally, we are a small business making a big impact on the county as we demonstrate the magic of the horse. The economic boost to tourism, the emotional and physical therapeutic impact, the historical and educational resources offered all contribute to the empowerment of the community. On a larger scale, we, compute, we, we contribute to the Make-A-Wish Foundation and Wounded Warrior programs because, again, we're trying to give back to the community locally and and on a larger scale. I have a hard time with what one of the men said that the horse is an invasive species brought over by the Spaniards. The horses have been here for as long as I can remember. Of course, I am only a 1966 baby, but I, I don't think that that's quite accurate um, as them being an invasive species. Um, I'd like to point out that on any given day, Sea Ponies removes, at our own expense, one to three bags of beach trash, in addition to cleaning the area in which we ride of hay, manure, and any indir indirect debris related to our rides. Sea Ponies organizes and participates in beach cleanups after major holidays, removing hundreds of pounds of trash. We have demonstrated compromise and respect by self-regulating and limiting all activity except when necessary on the Gulf side of the causeway. That, in our opinion, well, and brought to our attention, I believe by Ms. Kelly, was where the majority of the seagrass is. So we were trying to compromise, and we moved our all operation to the other side. Um, I think there is a little bit of um, misinformation out there concerning the number of rides we do per day and the number of horses we have there on any given day. During the height of our season, which is February through August, we, we um, offer two to four rides per day. They're a one-hour ride. We have typically six horses at the beach. Occasionally, we have 10. 
probably three or four days a week, we'll have 10. We ride six days a week. Off season, that's September through February, we offer, one, we, we, um, offer two to three rides a day, but we typically average one to two rides a day, four or five days a week, because it's cold. Kids are back in school. People aren't coming down during those months. Well, the people that are coming down during those months aren't interested in riding in the cold water. You see what I'm saying? Um, there are days that we aren't even there. The only exception um, during the off season in which we um, offer more than two rides or three rides is a Saturday. Because on a Saturday, of course, we have a little bit more interest. Um, I could expand for another 30 minutes based on emotion, but tonight I'm asking you to vote based on fact, not speculation. Your decision should represent evidence, not emotion. It's clear after reviewing the facts, the evidence, and the evidence, the damage is not caused by the, the animals. I also would like to mention, the one um, gentleman mentioned the turtle grass and how soft it is in that area. So this seems a little bit um, self-serving, but we're not gonna take our horses into that soft turtle grass area because that's gonna damage their stifles. So again, we don't want to be in that turtle grass area because we don't wanna damage the turtle grass. But also, we're not gonna do that because we, we, we need to take care of our horses as well. The other man mentioned that he had seen us cleaning up with a pool net and a bucket, we absolutely do. We do our best to catch everything that comes into the water. On averages, on average, a horse will leave a pile of manure, about 20 piles of manure on a daily basis. Now that's not during the three or four hours that we're there, that's during the whole day. 90% of the time, that's happening on land. The other 10% of the time, it's happening in water and we are doing our best to recover that. Again, the other person was talking about how the manure breaks up as soon as it washes ashore or up to the shore, it's breaking up. It just disintegrates. It's not like dog, dog park stuff. So in closing, I'd just like to thank you all for a favorable vote concerning horse owners. Are there any questions I can answer for you? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, one question. One question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. One question. The uh, you said there was some study on um, on the manure that uh, where it does not contain at the very beginning of your comments. Yes. What was that? The EPA excludes horse manure from solid waste waste regulation because it does not contain significant amount of hazardous chemicals and exhibits no hazardous characteristics. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Back to three minutes. Oh, no. Right. The rest are uh, three minutes. Uh, Jenny Cook. Monica Brushell, Brussel, and then Donald Hudgens. Hello. Hi, good evening. Hello, my name is Jenny Cook, and I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan. I live at 5327 North 7th Street in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I am the Michigan Equine Trail representative. So I do represent the state of Michigan in that regard. And um, I am, I want to thank you tonight for allowing me to speak, and I'm excited to be here. Um, our family has been a three-peat customer for Sea Ponies, and uh, we have enjoyed our uh, vacation here immensely. We, we really enjoy Florida, and it could be a place where we could end up someday. So thank you so much. Um, we have organized our vacations around the opportunity to ride horses in the waterway. And we spend nearly $3,000 in the area on tourism. So we stay, we rent a condo, and we stay for a week, and we go to your restaurants, and we shop. And for a small portion of that time, we pay $150, only for an hour, to go and enjoy the horses, the natural horses, in this natural environment. And it is a dream come true. It is therapy. It is um, so important. Uh, we just are so happy to, that we have this opportunity. During this each visit, I have not seen any evidence of seagrass being harmed in any way. We actually rode horses there today, and um, so that was really good news. Another good point, this is from December 23rd, 2013. 
about horse manure by the Kentucky Equine Research staff. And in this article, I will quote, an article on the site refers to the several studies that have found no evidence of threat to health of humans who encounter horse manure. While feces from dogs, cats, and other domestic pets can be a reservoir for transmission of various infections, uh, the uh, equine waste is virtually free of the types of microorganisms that can infect humans. Up to 80% of horse manure is water that quickly evaporates or leaches into the ground. While this liquid does contain microorganisms from the horse's digestive tract, it does not contain significant levels uh, uh, that are dangerous waterborne pathways or pathogens um, in like the springs and the streams. The rest of the manure is made up of undigestible plant parts such as structural fibers and grasses and grain hulls. This material dries up quickly, breaking down into small bits of organic matter that naturally fertilizes the ground. In appearance, uh, it's dried manure looks a lot like dried grass that can be found on a mowed lawn. If you're still not convinced, please consider this. The Environmental Protection Agency excludes horse manure from solid waste regulations because it does not contain significant amounts of hazardous chemicals and exhibits no hazardous characteristics, end quote. Uh, I also, every state that touches the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans have shoreline horseback riding available. I hope you continue to let this practice happen. It's a dream come true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Monica, please. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Um, my name is Monica Purcell, and I um, own and operate Cypress Breeze Farm, which is another uh, horseback riding business on a Skyway Bridge. Um, I'd like to start off and say that 2016, we also had had to get with the DOT, and they came and asked and asked us about permits and being able to continue to operate there. At that point, we actually worked with Senator Jeff Brandis to hang on um, to uh, get permits over to the FDOT, which we have email communications of. I sent it over to Kathleen. Um, and so anyway, just to note that. As far as the overhead photos in, um, across the bay, they're showing just this area where we operate, correct? So there's actually, I'm gonna give this in to whoever I can. Is there somebody I can pass this over to? You can see that. Okay, so this gives the other areas in which I've looked on Google Earth about uh, where seagrass has been destroyed. There's multiple, about five or six different locations that have similar scarring to what we are. The problem with these aerial photos that we are using to decide whether this is seagrass is number one, you can't actually see what type of muck is down there. So there's wetlands all along this area we ride in, there's quite a bit of mud. Sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't. I've looked at photos back to 2014, 2018, it's constantly changing. If you go back and look at all these different other locations I've provided, you'll see similar scarring, maybe not this year in 2019, but it might pop up in 2018. So there's not a regulation, like, it's not consistent. You have using it's depending on satellite, then have might have light, darkness, shading, weather, clouds, decide whether we can or cannot impact the seagrass. As far as what they're talking about for mud being deep, um, the impacts where we're going through, we can't actually operate through there. We're both sea ponies and we, us take our horses along the sand, which brings us to we're actually going along a sandbar along 275. So I have a list of different sourcing for actually seagrass uh, that's used by the Tampa Bay uh, Preserves, which talks about the sandbars and the locations and how the sandbars are affected in the seagrass. Um, this, on the top, there's actually a report talking about the area we ride in and the impacts of seagrass in that area being not consistent with uh, permitting seagrass, like the damage in that area. They're not trying to restore it because hurricanes come through and there's too high a wave. So there's a whole bunch of reports talking about lower t uh, Tampa Bay towards the mouth of it not being actually consistent with maintaining seagrass. Sorry, repeating myself. Um, but these are quite a bit of studies talking about seagrass and sandbars and where we operate is on a sandbar. Um, so they haven't actually ever brought that up into these studies. They also talked about the water quality, which I think has been covered overall. Um, but yeah, anyway, if I can just give that stuff as kind of put on record that there are plenty of sandbar Research documentation of the seagrass not being a good location for it. 
Thank you. Donald Hud Hud Hudgens. And thereafter, Leland Allen Brand. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, how are I'm you? Donald Hudgens. I uh, live at uh, 8060 37th Avenue in St. Pete. I've been a Pinellas County residence for 40 years. I am a patron of Cypress Beef Farm and a friend. And I'm not going to go through and try to rebut, you know, problems with the seagrass and whatever. It's just all I ask you is, based on all the information tonight, can you really draw a conclusion and pass this without any further study? Are you going to damage local businesses and thereby damage the economy without any kind of definitive proof? That's all I ask you to consider when you make your decision. Okay, thank you. Leland Alabram? Yeah, Did he leave? No, he's having somebody else speak for him. Leah Scott's going to speak for him. Okay. He sent a long email. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Hello. Good evening. So probably like everyone else, I wish I'd done way more preparation before coming up here. But um, first and foremost, I think we all have to thank people like Roger and Heather who have come up here and spoke passionately about protecting what we have here in Tampa Bay. It's something unique. It's something that needs to be protected. And Thank you for the work that you're doing, protecting our waterways. We're protecting our waterways so that we can use and enjoy them, so that we can continue tourism and, um, um, of course, protect you know the natural creatures that are supposed to be in the sea. But um, I'm also a guide for Cypress Breeze Farms. I've been out there for going on four years. Nearly every day, we're the ones who are out there. We're seeing what's going on. We're seeing the changes. I'm surveying the sandbar constantly, you know, looking up and down. I've seen every single change. Um, we're talking so much about seagrass when really we're going through so very little of it. When we walk the horses up along the shore and then we swim through an area of seagrass that is maybe, I'll be generous and say 20, 25 feet, if that is what it is, you know, some seagrass sprinkled in there. And we're walking along a sandbar for the bulk of our tours. We're up on a sandbar. Then we go back through the area of very deep water where there may be some seagrass underneath. We swim through on high tide days, and we're back along the shore of the beach. We're walking on sand. We're going through very little seagrass. Um, Jen came up here with her um, props and was able to convey to you a little bit of the positive impact that we're having out there. Our companies are out there again every day. Usually Jen and I are the first ones there arriving in the morning walking around with our trash bags, picking up the trash, the barbecue, the charcoal, you know, that was left there the day before. And we're getting the opportunity to spend time with people, locals. I'd say probably 40, 50 percent of our customers are locals and a lot of tourists and spending time educating them and showing them the changes, talking about, um, eco, um, you know, the changes in Tampa Bay and the sea creatures in Tampa Bay, getting to witness the sea creatures in Tampa Bay interacting with the horses. Um, the work that we've also done, you know, for Make-A-Wish Foundation and being able to share our horses and what we do here in Pinellas County. It's unique. It's something to be treasured and protected. And yes, we are leaving a footprint as anybody, or hoofprint, if you will, um, as anybody using that Tampa Bay area. But um, somebody else touched on the fact that um, the terminology and this amendment, which I understand is still yet to be defined, encompasses so many things and so many businesses and so many people. There are people who did not get the opportunity or maybe did not understand um, what is happening here with this ordinance that are going to be affected by it. You know, the kiteboarding people, the jet skiing people are all going to be affected by that little, by that clause in there about seagrass protection. Um, so there are a lot of people that didn't get the opportunity to be here today and didn't know what was going on that should. Thank I'm sorry, you. what was your name and address? My I'm name is Leah Scott. I am in Gulfport, 2908 57th Street South. Thank you. Are you Leah Scott? So there I, I am. So I had a second card on there that will wave. I have your card here. Unless I get okay. an additional three minutes. Um, but I feel like yeah, I would just to be to re reiterate. Excuse me, who is Leland Al Albrand? You are. So you're not speaking. I'm not speaking. Okay. Go speak for me. Thank Got you. It. All right. Thank you.
Um, thank you very much. Madison Mack? Okay. Hello. Hello. My name is Madison Mack. I live at 6904 274th Street East, Mayaka City. Some people might not know where Mayaka is. This is about an hour south, a couple hours southeast of here, not too far. Um, I think I can speak for the majority of people in Florida that's involved in agriculture. That's, they, we would all agree, Florida's turning into a concrete jungle. And with that brings more people, more pollution, more, you know, more trash. Um, I have seen personally in the last two years since I've been here in Florida, um, originally from upstate New York, um, we don't have beaches up there, we do in Florida, it's wonderful. Everybody wants to enjoy the beaches and enjoy our beautiful, you know, Florida locations. And I think I can speak for a lot of people when I say I've seen a major increase of trash on the beaches. I've personally taken pictures of trash cans about the size of this desk right here mounded over with trash. I've, um, I bring my personal horses to the beach. I also work with Gulf Coast ponies. And um, I've even taken bags out with me on my rides out to the sandbar to collect trash on the way out. And the majority of people, there's been days, there's the head count of people versus the head count of horses is 50 times over what, you know, over the horse, the horses, count of the whole count, head count of the horses. There we go. And, um, you know, the horses there, we all stick to a very, you know, specific little area. We ride out to the sandbar. We stick to the sandy areas. Um, horses have the least amount of impact. If you, you know, personally, I think I can speak for the majority of Florida horse owners. We welcome you all out to the beach, come out and see, you know, the horses, when they walk, they don't really don't tear anything up. It's simple up and down motions. Um, really, you know, if you, if you watch the kite sailors that come out, I've personally seen them tear up trails of, and you know, I'm not just in the kite sailors, they're all great people. I, you know, wish some were here today. Um, I know I would speak on their, on their behalf, but um, you can definitely see the trails that they tear up being out there and the boats that come and go um another the horse people and you know another note on the seagrass in the last few months since all of this has come about i have seen probably more horses than ever at the beach and i've also seen in these last few months the most amount of seagrass i think anybody's really ever seen in the area um so it's like you know if you could take that into account i appreciate it and thank you so much for listening thank you our last speaker is undecided, so we're now in the undecided category, and that's <laughs> Casey Hicks. And you've been very patient. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm uh, Casey Hicks, 37, Gardenia Street, North Clearwater Beach, near Lifelong Resident. I uh, didn't come in my suit. I came in my swimsuit uh, because I'm just here to kind of throw some light on this so you people can make an informed decision. Uh, the area that these horse companies uh, operate is also known as Kite Beach. And it's a very popular area for the kite surfers. And I'm kind of torn between my kite surfing friends and the horses. So that's why I'm like undecided here. Um, what I will tell you is that sea ponies is in fact number one uh, thing to do in St. Petersburg, I think, is it Pinellas or St. Pete? I'm not Actually, sure. Pinellas. Of uh, all the activities, they're number one. And <laughs> I think that speaks volumes. Um, I know that the owner of that company, uh, Carmen Herman, she runs a very good, honest business. And at the same time, I understand my kite surfing friends. They kind of need that beach, too. Um, my friends like Billy Parker, who is a pro kite surfer, they need this area for training. Uh, they can't go on Clearwater Beach because too many kids. That line has enough tension in it to fling Billy up way in the air. You can imagine if it hit a little kid. So. East Beach, Kite Beach is kind of where they uh, train, and uh, they need it too. Uh, I will say that <coughs> the kite boards don't really cause any damage to the seagrasses, 
but there's a new thing that they're using called the foils. And it's a little hard to describe if you don't know, but it has a thing, it's, it's like a, a lawn blade, just it could, it could actually cut all those grasses. And that's what I think the one girl was talking about there. Um, to me, you know, we're a tourism economy and, uh, you know, it's, you know, to me kind of silly to worry about a little bit of horse poop when the city of St. Petersburg is flushing millions of gallons of sewage into the bay. And then we have the phosphate mines and everything else. It's, it's all connected. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to kind of shed some light. I do know that the horse companies um, are making an effort to minimize any damages to the seagrass. It's in their, their best interest. And they do pick up a lot of trash. Um, I'm out on the beaches and everything, so I kind of see what's going on. So anyway, I hope that you'll maybe really think about the economic impact by out banning the horses on the beach because I think the tourists really love it and then they go home to Iowa or Michigan, wherever they're from, and they tell their friends and family and the folks at church, you know, what a great time they had. And that sends more people down. So something to think about. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, those are all the cards that I had for people who wish to speak on um, this agenda item. So um, unless anybody has any questions from the board for anyone, who spoke, then we'll close the public hearing. Question for staff? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you talk a little bit about the process for collecting the samples? We heard there were some questions about the methodology of the, how you collected the water samples for testing. Sure. Um, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection requires us to follow very specific procedures with regard to collecting bacteria. Um, these, the sample, the data that I presented today was actually conducted in, uh, by the Depart uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection in partnership with the Department of Health. Um, so those were not samples collected by Pinellas County, but we all have to be certified under the same set of standards. Um, those samples are then um, placed on ice. They are delivered to a state certified laboratory, analyzed, and those results are, are then provided. So it is conducted under a very strict regulatory set of standards that we all have to abide by when collecting samples. I have a question. Do we collect um, dog feces on the dog beaches? Um, the, test the waters there? The, um, the ordinance, the parks ordinance requires the pet owners to clean up. There is a requirement for that. Um, the Department of Health has a, has a monitoring site at Fort DeSoto, a, a healthy beaches monitoring site. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure exactly where it is in conjunction with the dog beach there, though. But have there been any problems there? Um, not that I'm aware of. Again, there's no seagrass in that, in that area. It's kind of open, the gulf area. There's no seagrasses. Um, and the parks department is... That's the only beach, dog beach, that we have. Um, and if you go on the website, there's very strict requirements. And cleaning up after your pets on the beach is absolutely required. So was it strategically picked so it doesn't have an impact on seagrasses? I couldn't say why that beach was selected. Maybe Jake might yeah, have some I'm history. Saying, <laughs> is it a beach that doesn't have seagrasses? It does not. It's an, it's okay. an active water area. So ten, seagrass is typically going to be found where there's not active mm -hmm. seagrass. Tidal flow. It I kind is of figured that, but I thought yeah. we'd explain it. It is. <laughs> was coming years ago. Commissioner Eggers, and I'm sorry, Commissioner Justice, did you have other questions? No, I'm good right now. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, just a the, the couple of the comments. One was to um, the sampling. Again, I think you touched on I touched on that a little bit. There's been some discussion about um, different areas relatively nearby um, where horses do go and horses don't go over here, but that the, the, the readings are similar or even higher in some of the non -ears. I don't, I, we don't have that data here in front of us to talk about, but what, what would you attribute that to if, if that were the well, case? Well, I, I mean, this particular 
you know, data, what, what it showed was there was the Florida Department of Environmental Protection went out there when there was, on days where there was no horseback riding activity. And on those days, the water quality is fine. The health standards are met. There's no issue with recreating in that water, swimming in that water, and the horses are not there. The recreation criteria that the state has set is fine. When the horses are there, more often than not, the criteria is exceeded, and that is where we have a challenge. Um, so the horse waste in the water is, again, it, it's, a, it's a problem with our current, our water quality protection ordinance, um, but also it's a public health <coughs> issue, and it, it does need to be addressed. Um, and I think maybe this is probably more for Jewel, but um, I, the, the one comment that was made that, you know, in terms of, like, taking a pause tonight um, is as it relates to the notification of what this ordinance can do. There was a couple people that made comments that this is a good ordinance because it, it opens up that possibility of addressing other areas that are causing damage, and yet I'm not sure that, I mean, we may have legally met the, the, the standards to notify people that might affect, be affected by this that really don't know that we're even talking about an ordinance that could affect them. And, and so it won't, it won't be like when we go tell those kite boarders that they can't do that anymore, that they'll have a chance to address us because the ordinance will be in place. That does concern me a little bit. And again, I'm not looking for, you know, double the audience here uh, to, to hear from, but I, I mean, I think that's, that's something that we, should, that we should seriously think about. We try to give folks, you know, that chance to come here and talk to us about issues. I think tonight was pretty much folks that um, ride horses in water. Um, I, 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 I just, I will say this, I, I mean, I, I didn't, I, I, I was a horse rider for the longest time. I, I didn't realize you could go with horses up, up to their, up to their neck. Uh, I, when I first started asking questions, I said, well, they ride on the beach or maybe a, part way up their their leg um, and they don't you know they're and so why don't they carry a bag and catch all that stuff and we're okay I didn't realize that they went out into the water the 90 percent 10 percent comment about you know where they do their do their damage uh, I don't know so I guess that, that, that's an interesting number I don't know I did want to offer up that you know um you know, Heather uh, came up and spoke from the Regional Planning Council, and she, she has a net uh, contact with the kiteboarding community, and she did notify the, con the um, kiteboarding community They're of this as well. Um, but they, that they were, you I know, they were notified. But I'm just saying and that I don't put, know that they realized the, no, yeah. what, what might be happening. And I emailed out the ordinance itself to everyone. So not everyone. just to notify, to everyone. To not just to, um, not just to notify them of the meeting, but I actually sent the ordinance out itself. The, to, to? To the stakeholder group, and then it was shared out amongst there because I don't have a contact with the kiteboarding community, so I use some of my I'm, resources I'm to the regional planning council. I'm just surprised that we haven't heard council. from any of them tonight. So, I mean, yeah. to, to the point that I don't know that they really know what's going on tonight. I'm not saying we didn't maybe make an effort, so I, I take back that comment, but perhaps they don't know that. Yeah. So. And boaters, too. I mean, boaters are creating issues, too, along, along. I think somebody made the comment that they're further out in the water and they're not near near land, but clearly they do go near land, too. So um, anyway, just a, those are the only questions I had right now. Commissioner Gerard. Well, I, I guess um, we want to give ourselves the opportunity to look into the whole kite border and boat issue as well. I mean, what we're trying to do is save seagrass. Um, as far as I know, when I owned a boat, I tried really hard not to run it into the ground because <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good thing for your boat, for one thing. I didn't know anything about seagrass at that point, and I think that's probably true of the kite boarders as well. They also don't want to be skidding on the sand. Um, but, you know, we can look at that too. I wonder if we have any information about kite boarding and what kind of issues there might be there. Um, again, the, the gentleman, I mean, people always yeah. have an opportunity to come and talk to us. Yeah. If, if we look and it starts looking <coughs> like they're also having an impact, I'm sure they'll be here to talk to us. Yeah. I'm not the biggest expert on kiteboarding, and the gentleman who came up and explained, you know, the normal, the, I didn't yeah, know about that. The, yeah, the different parts of it, and and that that can cause issues. But I'd <coughs> also like to um, say that you know what the ordinance allows us to do is to address something significant. You know, everybody makes an an issue. You know, a. That is a kite board. All right. So. Thank you. 
Um, so what it allows us to do is address, you know, if, if somebody does, comes in and does significant damage, that's what it's going to allow us to address. Um, so if there are significant damages associated with kiteboarding, then yes, we're going to have to have a conversation with them about not in, you know, going off into another area or staying out of the seagrass areas. Um, but it does give us that opportunity. It's not to go out and, and enforce on a boater who accidentally went aground. It's not for that purpose. It's for chronic issues and, and addressing something that's significant. Um, you know, we are a community of people. Um, everybody makes, you know, has this, you know, big, big water and uh, big water ways, and we all have to play out there together. And, um, you know, so that's what that element is about. It's not about getting every little thing. It's about taking care of the big stuff. Thank you. I did go to um, visit Florida's website after we were given the different preserves, um, and it does show that... Um, Cape San Blas, Amelia Island, Fort Pierce, Anna Maria Island, and um, Canaveral National Seashore, and St. John's County. A lot of them require permits. Yeah, that's beach riding. They, mm -hmm. they allow the horses to ride on the beach under permit. They're um, required to um, ride above the high tide line. Right, um, 25 feet. I, I don't know what it is. Some of them actually have, uh, I think it was Gulf County actually said they have a marked buffer line, and the horses must stay on the landward side of that, and then there's protection areas off of the dune vegetation too. And there, again, there's, again, they wear, a lot of them, the ordinances require the bags, um, and then the cleanup as well, if there's anything additional that makes it onto the beach. Um, but they're, yeah, they're permitting, they're very strict, and it's, it's on the beach, so, versus being in the water. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I think there's probably a good, very good reason why all these other areas do not allow horseback riding on the beach, and why people come up from Manatee County to ride on our beach. Uh, and I think we need to put a stop to it. Well, okay, one other question. They have Bradenton, it says Anna Maria Island. Yeah. Is that on the beach or in um, the water? It's, it's in the water. Uh, it's horse it's, surfing and. Um, it's it's um, in Palmasola Bay. Off of. Off the again, and there, like right I mentioned, right um, they actually reached out to me when they found out about this ordinance. They asked for a copy of it. Um, at the time, the Department of Transportation, when they had talked to them a couple of years ago, they had asserted jurisdiction in that on that particular issue. And um, my contact with the Florida Department of Transportation, who's been very um, supportive of what we're doing and helping us to move some of these things forward. Um, Asked, told me to, you know, tell my colleagues there to reach back out because the policy has changed and they might get a different answer. So I know they're going to be looking into it as well. Just one other question. And Commissioner Long, I think, was oh, next, sorry. and then Commissioner sorry. Eggers. Cool. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm trying to. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, so just for a little context, if I if I might. Uh, I brought this proposal forward from the Regional Planning Council since I have been your representative there ever since I was elected to the County Commission and I've heard all of the presentations from the folks who are at the Regional Planning Council and Commissioner Todd and I have worked very collaboratively for years on that council. I love horses. I've been a former horse owner. I've been very com did competitive riding with barrel racing, rodeos, and every other sport you could possibly compete in with a horse. That said, I am very aware, having raised my family here, and now I have five grandchildren, that Pinellas County is very different from the rest of the state. We are a very pristine county, very, very fragile. We only have one body of water to protect. We only have one planet to save. And this is an issue that I take very, very personally because once it's destroyed, it's destroyed. We already have the issue of all the oil spill that affected all of our Gulf waters. The issues with the sewage 
<clears throat> to me, one wrong does not make a right. We all know that the city of St. Petersburg, as well as the county and many other cities in our county, have issues with overflow because of the flooding and the storms. So, I mean, we have a lot of very serious issues to address over the next couple of years as it relates to our environment, as it relates to our sea level rise issues, our flooding, our stormwater management, and our climate. If we can't do the right thing here on this issue, then I don't know how we ever attack the really big, big stuff. You've heard from the experts. I believe in science. I have faith in our staff. They have served us very, very well, and I am very much in favor of this ordinance. <coughs> Mr. Eggers? Yeah, just, um, you know, the, uh, the part, could you read that ordinance part again where it talks about um, other, uh, other uh, activities that could damage? In other words, we're opening this up not just to the horses, uh, to, uh, trying to address the horses, but I just want to make sure I, I get that part. And and other activities so that particular provision says it shall be unlawful for any person to cause seagrass damage within the aquatic preserve system without a permit from the county and any other requisite government agencies authorizing the activity which may cause such damage the owner of any object or equipment causing such damage shall be jointly and severably liable with the operator of the object or equipment for such damage Okay. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, it just, again, I'm not, you know, I, I do, I, I appreciate the, ex the the science that's been discussed tonight, and I do understand the, the passion for what, what the writers go through. And I, from, from my perspective, I, I'm, I'm willing to support it. I just hate to be so encompassing without, uh, you know, each, each situation might be unique and might be different, and yet this ordinance allows for pretty broad brush uh, approach to multiple activities so I'm, I'm just I'll give you an example of where this ordinance the other part of the ordinance might have been helpful and about um, gosh maybe I don't know, tw I'm dating myself here right so 12 15 years ago there was a directional bore that went under Tampa Bay and the uh, contractor um, uh, had an accident and destroyed a bunch of seagrass near the Whedon Island Preserve. So it was, you know, and, and unfortunately we didn't have an ordinance and uh, this, the state, um, there was no enforcement over that and so it's just kind of remained bare. I mean, it'll restore over time, but um, the contractor could have been required to mitigate that damage and, and do that work had we had this ordinance in place. And so that's, you know, when I talk about damage, I'm not talking about, you know, a prop scar here and a prop scar there. That's that's not. We're looking at the chronic issues the, or the big events that have substantial impacts. It's not. It's not like I said, somebody running aground accidentally. That's. But there's a there's an industry of, of, of entertainment out on the water that could that has those issues, and yes. so. And we will. We um, we have a very active boater task force through the Tampa Bay Estuary Program and those recreational users, and we'll continue to work with them very strongly. I mean, we all have the same goals, especially I'm, I'm one of the chairs of the technical advisory committee for the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. I also am the vice chair of the management board. So we we have a broad network of of community partners, and we will continue to do that and work with those entities and make sure that we're it's not our intent to want to enforce on people to find people. We want to work with people and make sure that we're doing the right thing. But, we, but, but by this ordinance, we could. It would allow us, yes, if it, yes, we could. Okay. Um, anyway, I, there, Andrew Butterfield had asked to speak. We did already close the public hearing. Is if, if there's anything, or you're just against, so is that okay just to hold up your hand that or do you have any other further information that we haven't heard? I can't hear you. You're going to have to come forward. And, and Kelly, please stay front row and center. Thank you. 
sorry, man. I'm not sure if you're for or against. I just. Um, <laughs> my name's Andrew Butterfield, St. Pete Beach. Um, I've just. Uh, I know the city of St. Petersburg dumps millions of gallons of sewage in Tampa Bay without a second thought. It seems. Sea Life put their excrement in the sea. Freighters going in and out of Tampa Bay dump their sewage. Motorboats and jet skis run wild around the bay, and yet we feel six horses walking through a path in a shallow part of the bay is the most important issue for us to address. I disagree. I'd uh, ask you to dismiss this ridiculous piece of proposed ordinance, which of course has been placed at the last of the 43 agenda items <clears throat> to probably try to diminish pushback. But uh, I did the horse thing once, and uh, it was wonderful. It was safely run. It was quite an experience. and. Uh, their safe, safety was the ultimate uh, goal for everybody here. They're probably here, the lady that <clears throat> toured me around. But I, I just, I know wrong when I see it, and it's wrong to try to stop a wonderful thing that happens here when there's things right across the street that you should be taking some action against. Thanks so much for listening. Okay, thank you. Okay, tell me. Um, so I want to, I only was asking questions because I was just curious that other areas allowed this. Um, and I wanted to find out more about the dogs because I felt like it's relevant to the whole conversation. But, um, you know, I want to thank Mr. Wilson and Ms. Sheen Todd because they have been leaders in the environmental area. And it's because of their attention to this that we can look at this 50 years later and see the sea grasses and see the life blooming. So I support this. I just wish that there could be an alternative if we could find another area, but I'm not sure we can. We're, um, you know, 25 feet away from the seashore, bagged horses, that there would still be an opportunity for some kind of beach trail. I don't think we have that available, but it's just something that I, you know, had thought about. Commissioner yeah, So I don't, I don't have a question. I just have comments, if that's okay. So um, I went ahead and took the ride. Because I, I figured, I, you know, unless I see it, I don't know it. So I went and took the ride. And what I can tell you about the ride is it's exactly what they said. Um, the beaches were pristine. They, picked, they had a whole trash can of what they had picked up when they arrived in the morning. Um, every trailer had a muck bucket and a rake to pick up any droppings that the horses might have. I even drove where the private trailers were, and they all had muck, muck buckets and rakes to pick up any droppings. Um, and the beach was pristine. They took a very specific trail out on the sandbar. The horses spent most of the time on the sandbar. And then there was a very quick drop off, so the horses were swimming. So the horses were not walking on the seagrass, they were swimming above the seagrass. We did three swims each time we came back up on the sandbar. All the talking, all the instructions, I saw lots of fish. I saw the thin seagrass on the sandbar that the gentleman from DEP mentioned. Um, I saw lots of thick seagrass when we were swimming over it. The water was incredibly clear, especially after all the rain we had over the weekend. Um, saw lots of sharks. I was really surprised to see the bonnet had sharks. So um, I, didn't, I did not witness what your aerial is showing me because I saw enormous amounts of seagrass that we were swimming over and we were not stepping on. Um, the horses don't gallop. There was no stench. So a lot of things that were said is not what I witnessed. And so I, after, and, and they didn't know who I was until the end of the ride. Um, and what I can tell you is something else that they haven't even talked about. Many of these horses are rescue horses. They had one horse, Splash, was so emaciated, they had to put 500 pounds on that horse before someone could ride it. So these people are taking in these badly abused horses. And then they give an opportunity for those horses to exercise in the water where there's less impact on their joints. And it is a wonderful thing that these people are saving these horses that have been so badly abused. Um, and when you say that the, the poop is organic and it's, it doesn't equate to dog poop or anything else, if that's being tested in the water, if it's exempt in any other kind of waste, why is that not exempt in the count in the water? So what else I can tell you is I thought about it, I talked to them after the ride, and I asked if they'd be willing to compromise. So it's my understanding there's an enormous amount of seagrass on the Gulf side, right, the west side of the Skyway. And so the horses have not been going on the west side because they don't want to damage the seagrass because there's a lot there. But where the sandbars are, sand, seagrass doesn't really grow on sand, sandbars. Sandbars move, they ebb, they flow. They get bigger, they get smaller. Um, I can tell you I spend weekends on the sandbar at John's Pass all the time. I see dogs on that sandbar all the time, pooping. No owners are picking it up. It's going right in the bay. We're gonna, are we, we going to start patrolling every single sandbar? It's just silly. 
So what I asked them is, would they be willing to compromise? And I don't know if this is a possibility, but Fort Pierce has a permit. And if they're going to ride the horses in the water in Fort Pierce, they have to get a permit. So if we required a permit, and there's two trails on the east side of the bridge, and if we allowed them to pay a permit and only allowed one trail for six months, allowing the seagrass, and if we put plugs in the seagrass on the second trail, that can grow and get thicker, and they're only using one trail. And then six months later, with the permit money, we could replug the seagrass where they were on that trail while they moved to the other trail. That allows us to ensure that the environment stays at least healthier, and it doesn't take away the ability for them to allow this, the tourists and the citizens to have an amazing, amazing natural ride to see the natural beauty on a horse was just incredible. And I think that we can compromise. I think that we can work with them and come up with some kind of compromise that allows them to save these horses that are so badly abused and allow them to exercise them and allow the tourists and the citizens to have that wonderful opportunity to see the beautiful nature that's out there on a horse. It's just incredible. And I think if we can work for some kind of compromise, whether it's east-west, you do one year on one side, one on the other, I think the west side is so so full of seagrass, I'd hate to even damage it at this point. And I think you can work on the east side to do some kind of compromise. And I think that allows nature to continue and the citizens and the, the tourists to have an opportunity. And I would rather see us, rather than ban them all together, try to find some kind of compromise in which they can still run their business and subsidize what it costs them to, res to rescue these horses. To put 500 pounds on a horse was an enormous amount of expense just to save an animal that was so badly abused. And all this does is barely subsidize what they're spending to save these animals. So I think it's bigger than just all of this. And I think that there is a compromise. And I would really like to see staff work with, uh, with the citizens. I mean, there were two. There was only one. At that time, there was only one business. Sea, sea Ponies was there, and that's who I rode with. Um, Cypress hadn't come yet because I think they only had one scheduled tour that day. And the other horses that were there were all private citizens that came, and they had two horses in the trailer. There were two of them, so there were four. Um, and they were incredibly, incredibly respectful to the environment in which they were using that beach. And I would really like to see the staff go back. I think there's a compromise. I think you can save the seagrass and you can do the environment. The, the poop is definitely organic. It's strictly grass. When I watched them where they pooped, some of the horses, horses ate it because it was food again. And then I watched the fish come up and eat it. It did dissolve immediately very quickly. Um, urine is urine. They're not going to stop the urine. The dogs are urining in the water as well. People are urining in the water for that, for that matter. Um, but I would really like to see us not eliminate this activity in our area. And I'm, a big, I'm big on the environment. I mean, I'm the one that got on St. Pete and made sure that something was done about it. So I'm a big proponent for the environment, but I don't think this is the way to do this and ban them completely. I think we can work on some kind of compromise. Whether it's that idea or another idea, I really think we can do something. Um, and Callie? <laughs> uh, you know, when we met with um, the, serv the service providers um, and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, that was one of the first things we talked about, is there an alternate location? There was another provider at the meeting at the time, and um, we, we said, you know, you guys know the area. We'll look. You look. The Department of Environmental Protection looked. In Pinellas County, there, we couldn't find a location, and we asked everybody for their input on that. Um, there was not an alternative location. The third provider actually um, called us and advised that he was not going to be coming to back to the Skyway anymore. His operator, Joe, who leads the tours, um, acknowledged that there was absolutely no way to conduct these rides without impacting seagrasses. And it was at that moment that that provider said, then we're done. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to be part of damaging the environment. And so he is no longer riding there. I, I appreciate the experience. And I've, I've been out there. They're magnificent animals. They're gorgeous. Uh, I just, from a very prof my professional opinion, is it's the wrong activity in the wrong place. It's a, it's a great thing to do, but it's just not a fit for that location. And if, you know, there were some, you know, beach location where we could have a program like these other places and have those, those safeguards in place, that would be great. I, I just don't know of it. And a lot of our beach, most of our beaches are within the cities who already restrict animals on the beach. So it would be conversations with them to see if there's somewhere where they might 
be willing to say, yeah, you know what, we'll say, you know, horseback riding from here to here, you know, during certain times of the year. The other part of this, and you might have seen it in some of the other counties, is during sea turtle nesting season, it's, it's very restricted to maybe a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours at night. So we have that challenge too. And the, um, the operators that operate on the beach have to go through um, training to recognize the sea turtle um, uh, nests and their drag lines so that they don't interfere with that nesting. So um, if I can respond. There's no reason Pinellas County can't have the same strict ordinances. There's only two trails in which they can use on the east side of that bridge where there's deep water. So, so they don't walk up to their neck. That's when they're swimming is when they're at their neck. And the feet are not touching the ground. And so there's only two trails in which they could do that where there's deep water. And, and, um, and there is no reason why we couldn't have sea turtle restrictions. There's no reason why we couldn't have um, limited days or limited times of the year when the water's cold, maybe not, or turtle, turtle season, maybe not. But I still think, I still believe that there is a way to compromise. And if we did collect a permit, just like the other places do, that would give us the revenue to do the, sea, the seagrass planting every time they, they rotate to another location. Yeah. And you can go right back in there, replace that seagrass, and immediately help with that water quality. So, and then when they're not on the other side, that's all growing and working on the sea quality. And that particular area by the Skyway has plenty of areas in which it flushes and flows. It's not like other areas that, does, that do not flush like that because you've got the big wide bridge, you've got other smaller bridges. That water flow is significant over there. Um, and so I still believe, I believe with all my heart that you can do something to compromise and not end this, this business for them and for the citizens in Pinellas Park and Seminole that have horses or people in St. Pete that have horses in Manatee County because there's so little space here to have our horses that we don't take that away from them. That's just, I feel very strongly about that and I really, really truly believe that there is a compromise here and if you collect a permit just like they do in the other places, that gives us the revenue to, to replace that seagrass on a regular recurring basis. Um, the one, the one I'll, I'll clarify, there was some statements about, you know, horse waste being exempt by EPA from hazardous waste. And basically what that means is it doesn't have to go to a hazardous waste landfill. It means that it can be disposed of in the trash. That's what that means. Um, it's not hazardous material. It doesn't have chemicals. So it doesn't mean it's fit for human health. And so we still get back to the human health criteria. and. The horses and the manure and the urine in the water cause exceedances that are dangerous to public health. And we can't resolve that aspect of it, and our ordinance strictly prohibits it. I cannot, in good conscience, um, and I don't think our attorneys would like me being, I'll enforce on you, but not you. Um, there's got to be. and so. I, I agree. I wish you know there was a compromise so we could have beach riding. I, I think it's amazing opportunity, um, and maybe there's some way we could work with the cities to see if that's something that we could do in the future. Talk with them about designating area, having You'll a program like this. Of Mexico. But the only place you could ever do it is in that location because there is no, there are no people. There are very few people. There's very little land. There's tons of flow. And, and when you say that on the horse increment, Gulfport has a problem, and it's because of the birds and the, and the dog park right on the water. You've got Fort DeSoto with the dog park on the water. I go on the sandbars. The dogs are doing it in the, in the water. And I just, I, you know, you can say all you want about the cities and the sewers and the county and, and what Clearwater, Safety Harbor, St. Petersburg. I can name them all. And for the 16 horses, maybe that at a maximum will be on the beach isn't doing nearly the damage, not even a microcosm of the damage that we do with our sewers and our wastewater. And, and I don't think that makes a big enough difference on our flooding and our stormwater that we're talking about when you're talking about maybe a maximum of 16 horses in the water, just my opinion. So I, I really wish you'd, you'd consider a compromise. Commissioner Gerard. Um, anybody else? Bottom line is it's a, an aquatic preserve and this is an improper activity. Um, how long does it take when you plant seagrass for it to take hold and actually be viable? Randy, can I phone a friend? Somebody knows the answer to that. Uh, it really, okay. <laughs> Sorry. 
I knew we were going to have Mr. Reynolds go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm not really a seagrass expert, but, I, but I've been around it a lot of years. But it, it really depends on where it is and the conditions and the, the species of seagrass. The shoal grass that we talked about on the, on the, um, the shoals can come back pretty quickly, I'd say, within... I don't, Jake actually probably knows more than I do about the exact timing because they did a lot of studies of seagrass scar recovery in, down in Fort DeSoto. But the turtle grass is uh, what we consider is, it's called more of a climax species. And, and the horses do go through the turtle grass. They actually walked a line of them walked through diagonally there when I was there a couple of years ago and I was snorkeling in the water and then saw the horse manure. But, and I'm from Texas, rural Texas, born and raised, so I, I have nothing against horses. And, but anyway, um, I would say it takes, it takes um, several years at least for, for the seagrass beds once they're severely damaged to come back. And there are some people who have said over 10 years for some. It's not something like uh, you just sod a lawn or something like that. And uh, would you agree it's not like sodding a... That's probably true. Uh, yeah. We, done, we did a lot of initial studies in Fort DeSoto, as, as you know, and some folks know. And it took a long time and you, to put them all back. And the rhizomes are the, are the big issue. Yeah. Uh, they live, actually they can be cut off and it won't be a problem because they'll grow right back like lawns. But the rhizomes are harvested or cut, that stops the growth and it takes a long time for them to go back. And even the soils and everything else have to be done really well uh, for them to really restore. Mm -hmm. uh, the halodulia, the shoal grass, can come back pretty quickly, but not tur not thalassia, which right. is the turtle grass. It doesn't. It is more difficult. It really is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And it's done by sprigs. That's true, yeah. but it does take a long time for them to regrow. And let's, Mr. Wilson, do you know something about seagrass growing back? No, but I just feel. Uh, um, we're we're done with the public hearing. Thank you. <laughs> with all respect. Okay. Anybody else have any more questions? All right, then um, move approval. Second. Okay, there's a motion by Commissioner Long, a second by Commissioner Gerard. Um, question. Yes. Um, so I guess um, I, what I'm hearing is then there's there's no concern, and I'm asking that no concern about opening the door in this ordinance for other areas of recreation um, that there doesn't won't have the scrutiny of this board. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be setting this thing in motion. It doesn't come back here. No. Um, and so, again, my concern about other users of, of recreational activities, that's number one. And number two, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of floored by the, the, the your, your conversation. You're, you're relaying your experience. Wow, that was amazing that you took amazing. the time to go out there. I um, almost feel like it ought to be a prerequisite but um, to, to, to making this decision. But... I, you know, I, 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 why we can't just slow it down here? I mean, I, I, it's like let's just get it done, and then we're then we're kind of done with it. And I, I mean, I know there's a lot of science to this, and I'm not discounting that, but, gosh, can't, can't, no, I'm not. Great. Well, I guess that's why I asked, you know, if there were other options yeah. for other yeah, areas, that's a, that's and that other to me options. is kind of a compromise to see if there may be. And so I don't think we're shutting the door on that necessarily. Um, if I don't know any, I agree, none of the city beaches would work, but, um, you know, maybe there's a part of Fort DeSoto or something else that could. So, so let me ask you, uh, technically, how, how would that work then? Let's just say that we, we pass this ordinance tonight and, and we continue the conversation with an open mind about looking for alternatives. Yeah. Uh, what, what would happen at that point? Do we bring it back staff, and amend well, the staff ordinance? Staff would go do some research and right. come back and see if there were any other possibilities for Can us. Can they do the research before we vote on this? Huh? Can they do the research before we vote on this? Because this shuts the door. Um, it shuts the door. If it depends. You know, you have a motion on the floor. You have a second. Um, I think that unless... Um, Somebody has a substitute motion that can overrule, or they move, remove their motion for further discussion. Um, I'm not sure how we approach this, other than I think we can give staff direction that we'd like to look at if there's some other areas that this could work. Can I ask a so, question about that? And that's so. If we looked at other options. As far as you can see, would any of them include being able to be in the water with the horses? 
Or are we think talking so. about beach riding? I, I mean, uh, an alternative that I would propose would be beach riding, um, not in the water. It just, you know, to your point about preserve. the about the aquatic preserve, to the whole point about public health and water quality. We have, you know, and I and I respect all the comments that have been made, and we have significant challenges. I'm not discounting any of it, you know, it, infrastructure management. I mean, but. You know, it did. You know, we got where we are by incrementally improving things. It wasn't there was no magic pill to saving Tampa Bay. It was a lot of little things that all made the difference. And so, um, to be honest, um, you know, like for example, if an evaluation was done to look at a, a segment of Fort DeSoto for beach riding, that would actually be an amendment to the Parks Ordinance. So it, this wouldn't even affect it at all. It would be it would be a different ordinance. It definitely does not close the door at all, in my, in my professional opinion. Um, it's it's a different process, and you know I'd be happy to work with the Parks Department to evaluate that as well as our service providers to see what what viable, viable options, and we can also reach out to the areas where that beach riding is done. And they, I'm sure they have a lot of lessons learned: what what works, what doesn't work. You know, so. I don't look at where they have them in the water, because I, if they're making it work, I would I believe we can make it work. And we have incredible flow there, incredible flow there. I have a question or comment, I think it was. Um, <laughs> just that I, I'm encouraged that we have that other part in there that allows Kelly and her staff to look at other things that might be. In, we pay her to keep an eye on our water, her and all her staff. I want her to go looking for other impacts on the water. I'm not worried about it spilling over in the kite borders. If they're damaging the seagrass, then great, let's go get them. Um, I think that's a great thing. Well, we've all stood up and cheered and been grateful for the restoration of these seagrasses. And it's been and 50 years. Yeah, it's 50 taken years that of, long. So it's, it's significant. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. Um, unless there is a substitute motion, um, we are going to proceed with the motion by um, commission. Yes, sir. Is the motion is it going to include giving staff direction to look at? These I don't know. Ask the move um, the Sure. To is alternatives to. I'm happy to for writing the staff to sort of look at. But sure. as Kelly already indicated, it does not affect this particular right. ordinance. It would have to be something a else. Amendment to our water. parks right. ordinance. Well, so I, I would like to move forward on and call the question on the motion before us mm -hmm. right now. Please, Commissioner Eggers, do you feel satisfied that at least we could um, we could make a separate make a separate, separate motion. motion? Why don't we do that? That says let's let's deal with this ordinance now, and then make a separate motion to look at options. There you go. How about that. Okay, we will um, ask you to pull up the voting cards. Okay, it passes five to one. Um, Commissioner Eggers, would you like to make well, that I motion? Well, I definitely want to give staff direction to continue looking at a horse riding on our beaches, and you know whether I guess the horseback riding, horse riding up to their necks is not allowed. I don't know what would be allowed, but I'd like to investigate, you know, horses on our right. beaches, whether it's whatever uh, as alternatives, how how other areas manage it, and how they stay within the bounds of environmental. You know correctness and all of that but there's got to be because people are doing it so i think we need to be looking at it and i think we need to be looking at it with an open mind um so i'd just like to have staff second that motion that. okay we have a motion by commissioner eggers and a second by commissioner justice um to look at some other op options optional locations we'll go ahead and pull the voting cards up Okay, that passes unanimously. I want to thank each and every one of you tonight for coming and for presenting your passion or your um, information. We are very appreciative of that, and um, it's, we're very grateful that you're, you were here. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.